Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Agnes Sue Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. As the founding director of our Center for Women's History, I am proud of the growth we've achieved. In only a few short years, we've been able to accomplish so much in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions, all of which foreground women's critical role in American history. We are also thrilled to broaden our reach as we further our collaboration with the American LGBTQ Plus Museum, which will be located in our new building when it opens in 2025. Together, we hope to grow to even further heights as we continue to share important stories in American history that have long been overlooked. Tonight's program will run approximately 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. We invite you to submit questions through the Q&A chat box at any time, and we hope to get to as many questions as we can. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers and moderator this evening. Mame Tenzar, known as Severely Mame, is a practicing witch and third generation, at least, fiber artist. She was born in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts and grew up surrounded by the history and lore of Salem, where she also lived briefly. She studied at the Montserrat College of Art. Mame has continued to study both fiber arts and the occult, herbalism, folk magic, and traditional witchcraft independently. Mame's knitting patterns and vintage sewing tutorials are available on her YouTube channel and Patreon under the name The Vintage Stitch Witch. Elena Kanegi Laux is a descendant of the Amish and grew up between the US and Japan, where she was immersed in both traditional Mennonite craft and the DIY fashion scene in Tokyo's Harajuku neighborhood. After receiving her BFA in textile design from FIT, she won a grant which funded a four month trip to study lace making across Europe. In 2015, she co-founded the Brooklyn Lace Guild, an organization dedicated to the preservation of lace making, and began teaching bobbin lace classes at the Textile Arts Center. In 2018, she completed her MA in Costume Studies at NYU, where her thesis relied on interviews with lace makers conducted on her European travels. Currently, she is the collection specialist at the Antonio Ratti Textile Center at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Our moderator, my colleague Karen Ben Horan, is a fashion historian and curatorial scholar at the Center for Women's History. A former Mellon pre doc in women's history at the Center, she is a PhD candidate in history at NYU. Karen is the co curator or co creator of the documentary film Mrs. G, which recently won the first prize at the Phoenix Art Museum Fashion Film Festival, and she has curated several fashion exhibitions in New York and Israel. She co-authored the fashion history survey, She's Got Legs, A History of Hemlines and Fashion, and edited the book, The Sweater, A History. I will now turn the conversation over to Karen, who will get things started. Thank you, Valerie, for this really kind introduction. Um, and let's just jump in. Um, welcome, Mame. Welcome, Elena. Um, Valerie touched a little bit about your personal histories, but I was wondering to start us off, if you could share a little bit um, about what in your personal background growing up made you interested in textiles and in fiber arts. Uh, Mame, let's start with you. Hi there. So I grew up in a family of makers. Um, my mother always, you know, made my Halloween costumes, my sisters too. Uh, and, you know, we weren't rich by any means. So we kind of had to do a lot of making our own fun at home. Uh, and being a child of divorce, I spent a lot of time with both of my grandmothers who were both, uh, I don't think they'd call themselves fiber artists, but they were makers nonetheless. Uh, both of them were knitters. One of them was a well-known quilter in New England uh, and, her mother was the town seamstress um, before I ever existed. Um, so it was just a constant in 
my life uh, because of the people that raised me. And it's had a, you know, very lasting effect on everything that I do. What about you, Elena? Well, I always have to go back to my ancestry, which is um, Amish and Mennonite. So my ancestors were um, Pennsylvania Dutch, and I was born outside of Pennsylvania, where, you know, I grew up taught to embroider and crochet and quilt and sew by hand just at home. But when I went to art school, I thought that fine art equals painting. So I studied painting initially, and then I would go home and sew and embroider, and people were like, why aren't you in the fibers program? And I was like, what's that? So eventually I switched and I ended up doing a degree, several degrees in textiles and history and making. And I've sort of been down the rabbit hole ever since. But, um, you know, I think these days I'm getting more back interested into my own heritage, studying Pennsylvania Dutch language and also some of the folk religion traditions. So, you know, researching this has been such a joy. It feels like a new beginning, but such a natural progression of my research. And, you know, I was doing a lot of digging into the, you know, religions of the folk religions of the um, pre-Christian Germanic groups and of the Hexerai and Urblave and these different traditions and reading specifically about Amish and Mennonite traditions. And I was like, this is folk magic. You know, you guys are there. It's not just um, the idea of Christianity that we have. So it's it's really been a joy to dive into this. Yeah, it's so uh, woven into your history uh, in a way, uh, both of you. So one of the most fascinating objects that we have in the exhibition uh, is a tape room owned by Rebecca Putnam from um, around the same time of the witch trials. And the Putnams were this powerful family in Salem Village, and they're known for instigating some of, the, or many actually, of the witchcraft allegations. Uh, yet, we can see here carved into the handle of the loom, symbols of both, uh, of both Christian and uh, folkloric magic. Um, meant to kind of ward off uh, evil spirits. And it really shows us, uh, we use it in the exhibition to really show that even within this Puritan household, we can see counter uh, beliefs. We can see that folkloric beliefs existed even within that household. So Mame, I thought maybe you could um, talk a little bit or explain to us a little bit about folk, uh, uh, folk witchcraft. How does it relate to your own practice, both uh, as a witch and as a meter? So folk witchcraft is going to like be called folk magic. Like it's going to have a lot of different variations on kind of what it's called. But the idea is it's not a religion. It's just a practice that people of all different religions can do. And every person has a different kind of variation on what that is that's going to be affected by where they live, the folklore of that place, the folklore of their family, uh, and what their like traditions are. Uh, so for me, I am a folk witch from New England. I currently live in the desert, but I know kind of my family's like Polish traditions and things like that. But then also just the things I grew up with, which I was talking about, like a lot of sewing and knitting uh, were all just a constant in my household. So for me to be making something is putting like a lot of myself into it, which is the same thing that I'm gonna be doing when I'm doing any sort of magic. Um, so it is, Oh, like one in my world, one doesn't particularly exist without the other. Uh, they're particularly woven together because of what I do. As a knitter, there's, you know, a family line of it where I think most women in my family know how to do it. And I think some of us enjoy it. Um, and same with sewing and the like kind of handy crafts uh 
feminine art type things, um, they all kind of have influenced what it is for me to like make things. Sorry, I'm kind of going in circles. I uh, am not. And no, it's it's actually great it. because I, I I really actually want you to talk to expand a little bit about this overlap you're talking about. It seems to me that it's almost like these two threads that are so uh, intertwined, and I'm really interested to know how witchcraft plays into the knitting. So, like, there is when I was talking about folk magic, I talked about how like fairy tales, folk charms, things like that, all kind of work their way in, there's common uh, superstitions that go along with anything. <laughs> like every little thing can have a superstition depending on where you are in the world. And knitting is for sure one of uh, those that has uh, a lot of them. Uh, the best known one is maybe the boyfriend sweater curse. Uh, and it says that if you are dating someone and start knitting a sweater for them, uh, before you finish the sweater, you'll break up. And that is like, I think every beginner knitter hears about this and it, for sure. I will say, it is a scary, uh, you, like, I don't want to test it. Is there a workaround? And, the... that's, and that's where kind of the bits of witchcraft and folkcraft come in. There's always going to be a workaround, a way to, skirt the the superstition and in one of the ways that I found and I do I have a partner who I love and I don't want to potentially <laughs> lose them <laughs> for the sweater I'm knitting them uh so I knit an intentional mistake into every like sweater that I make for them uh some traditions say that leaving a mistake in your knit keeps it so that your like soul doesn't get caught in it. Uh, but I just use it to make sure that the boyfriend curse doesn't claim any more victims. <laughs> uh, Elena, are there any other knitting or weaving or lace making curses? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, I did a lot of digging and I definitely came up with some specific things that I will talk about from my own cultural heritage. We won't be talking outside of our sort of personal practices here. We don't want to trod onto closed practices. So just to say that this conversation is really very, has to be narrow because we don't have, you know, all the time, but this is really a global thing that mm -hmm. you find. And, you know, as a lace maker, lace making is such a slow, repetitive process. There's traditions of, you know, chanting tells and songs that go along with lace making. And to me, it makes so much sense that these traditions would, would overlap. So I, you know, I did mention in our earlier conversations and in our um, talking about this, that there is actually a lace tradition in Ipswich, Ipswich, Massachusetts, which is just north of Salem, that that this is an industry that really takes off in the 18th century and that Alexander Hamilton talks about. But even as early as the 17th century, you see records of lace makers in Salem and Ipswich that have, you know, come over. Um, from England and brought these traditions with them. Um, and when I was digging, you know, of course, there's, there's clear overlap between these things that happen in the domestic sphere that are very intimate um, throughout history that have primarily been practiced by women. But what's difficult is to find sources and to, you know, find records of these. I did, however, um, find in relation to sort of talismans on the on the tape loom of Rebecca Putnam, um, mm -hmm. I found a reference all the way back to the 11th century of a Spanish council complaining about women hanging idolatrous kind of talismans on their looms while they're working. So there's really an ancient history of this. There's complaints about the overlap between weaving and textiles that I found dating back to the 7th century. So from you know, early Christians complaining about these pagan traditions. But um, the specific examples that I found are in the Pennsylvania Dutch tradition, and they distinguish between the sort of hexerei, which is the like witchcraft or dark magic, and the sort of brauscherei, or the sort of more the folk magic that's protective against hexerei. Like, um, so they're sort of oppositional forces here. Um, and in the hexerei tradition, there's, there's a few things that, um, interlace with textiles. So there's a spell casting to prevent someone from escaping. If you take a needle 
um, that was used to sew the gown of a corpse and draw the needle through the hat or, sh or shoe of the person that you're seeking to fasten, um, they cannot escape you. And there's another tradition that, um, these are from the folk religion of the Pennsylvania Dutch book, which is really an excellent resource and has been a joy to read. Um, but that also, if you'd like to win every game that you engage in, tie the heart of a bat with a red silken string to your right arm and you will win every game at cards. So these were considered, this is not a curse per se, but these mm -hmm. were not considered um, the positive form of witchcraft. These were mm -hmm. sort of, um, or folk magic, they were considered more of witchcraft, in fact. Uh, and I remember when we looked at uh, Potnam Loom together, um, you pointed out that some of the uh, symbol look like they came with a or made by a professional who made the loom where other look more as if they were done by uh, unprofessional hands. So it's really telling of um, that these beliefs existed um, but, and within this households and, and uh, were used and circulated these symbols. And it kind of actually brings me this idea of the, the home and sort of like the sphere of women brings me to my next question. Uh, because it seems to me that between kind of the 1400s and the 1700s, when we get some of these stereotypes around who is a witch, how does a witch look like, many of these symbols that were associated with witches relate to their class status. Um, if we think about uh, a witch riding a broom, um, I mean, who's using a broom, right? Um, to me, it seems to, and, and um, I would like to hear from you what you think, that it um, represents maybe a fear of social reversal where kind of the servant um, can become or can put a curse on their um, masters. Um, how, do you, how do you think it relates to women working um, as weavers, spinners, less makers, um, how do you think it relates to that? Well, it's interesting because today the term spinster is used as a negative terminology, you know, of, of uh, someone who is a lonely old woman. But historically you see, um, there's actually oppositional anxieties about um, women who are spinners emasculating men. So I think there's a slide of from these medieval manuscripts, it might be the next one, um, that depicts uh, maybe the next, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm awesome. Here we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> but there was this whole genre of the emasculating distaff where you see these depictions of women um, beating men and jousting with men with their distaffs and there's there's also you know there's gender and transphobic anxieties here of, of men feeling emasculated by women's work but also fear of women's power um and it's you know it's so telling to me that that during this time period um that there's this uprising of you know accusations of of witchcraft against women in this time when they're actually able to bring in money and work on their own independently. So there's there's anxieties that women will, you know, rise up against men. Um, let's see. So this, this actually dates all the way back to the ancient Greek myth of Heracles. Um, and, you know, I will, I, will, I will clarify that my specialty is the early modern period in Western Europe, which is a time period in which actually weaving was primarily done professionally by men. But when I was digging into the more ancient sources and the more domestic sources in New England, a lot of these were, were women doing this um, practice. So it, it just, it seems like it was telling that it was threatening to have women weaving and that later when this was professionalized, it was done by, by men. So it was almost taken away from them. And what was left was the distaff and was spinning. Um, because that was almost, it was a very low paid, the lowest paid work that was done in textiles. And you needed 10 spinners for one weaver. So it really had to be the lowest paid form of labor. May, would you like to add anything? Compared to Elena, I truly uh, know nothing historically. Uh, <laughs> and I've been, I, on this topic, I was enjoying really listening in because uh, she has such a vast knowledge that I could not even understand how to accumulate. Was, um, 
were women seen during that time per period, women who were, um, you mentioned when, when we spoke that um, the fact that they were making money from uh, making textiles uh, was seen as a threat to organized religion, which at the time controlled some of these practices. Can you expand a little bit about that? Well, um, you do see that, like I mentioned in the, the early records, there are women um, invoking goddesses and they're weaving and things like that. And, and in, the, in my time period, in the early modern period, um, that we're looking at the development of lace making, for example, happening in Northern Italy in the 16th century, um, this is all organized in convents, and this is primarily organized and work done by nuns and orphans and sort of the most marginalized women in these societies um, who the church is able to, and these organizations that are producing this very expensive, costly, labor-intensive textile for wealthy people, they're able to keep these women isolated. The, you know, the lace-making centers you'll specifically see are outside of cities. Um, and they are, you know, further away they, and unable to sort of sell directly to clients. And there's specific legislation there as well that um, male guildsmen and merchants legislate and fight against women creating organizations of their own um, and and selling their works directly. So it's 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 very clear that there's these anxieties about it. And as and as upsetting that is to hear, it's. It also shows you how powerful that they believe these women were, that they had to protect themselves, that they didn't want this competition of these women. And, you know, I think this is also why we have so few um, kind of records of the specific intersections of textile making and folk magic, because they so clearly are linked to each other in the domestic sphere. But perhaps these women were not literate. Perhaps they, you know, this is not something that was written down. They didn't want this to be found. Um, and I think this this leads to a conversation that Mame and I had about the sort of validity of sources in different in witchcraft and in historical research that there's sort of these anxieties about we have to be using sources that are written documentation about these things. But if you're researching marginalized mm -hmm. women throughout history or yeah. around the world, you can't necessarily find um these sources through traditional methodologies and so we we mm -hmm. sort of have to go into the oral histories and the folklore and these mythologies in order exactly. to cover these stories maybe Absolutely. i don't know if we need to talk yeah. about um upgs a little bit too or if i'm just totally jumping around here but no, no. Oh, first. elena and i were talking yesterday on this topic about uh you know there being a lack of resources on this topic um and in the like occult and magic world, there's the acronym UPG, which is unproven personal gnosis. Uh, and that when people are writing about their practices, they'll kind of use that as a disclaimer of like, this is what I do, this is my practice. And, you know, it's not a uh, proven fact by any means, it's just it's my personal practice and my findings. And I think we have to rely heavily on that magically in this field. Um, when Elena and I were speaking, she had brought up just now even the topics that we both love, which is, you know, witchcraft and the fiber arts. Um, there's obviously not going to be a ton written by women on these topics in general because of like the nature of writing down anything having to do with being a witch is going to put you in like danger. And do you even know how to read and write as a woman in whatever time mm -hmm. frame? Mm -hmm. uh, so anything, any direct links written about these things are like few and far between and probably you know potentially like non-existent to an extent uh so we have to go based off of personal practice and sift through uh fairy tales and folklore and all of these things to find the wisdom that the like particularly women have hidden in like tales that came before us 
um, one of the sort of like threads that we started discussing is um, how sort of like the depiction of witches during this time period. And here there's um, a painting from the exhibition and in the back you can see this witch kind of hunching over a boiling pot, how this uh, sort of like the, both the visual and literary depiction of witches creates a stereotype during, during that time period. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could, um, Elena, we'll start with you and maybe if you can follow up, um, talk a little bit about fairy tales and how uh, practices of spinning and weaving figures into the plot line. And then uh, maybe if you could talk then a little bit about what um, the way that you're using spinning for spirit communication. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's so many there's so many fairy tales that you that you find that talk about spinning and weaving, but particularly spinning because this is so closely associated with women and globally, you know, like I said, weaving traditions actually often were the responsibility of men, but um in different regions except for in the sort of domestic sphere but spinning was really almost exclusively like a female and we're using gendered binary language tonight because we're talking about history, but you know, um, today we have different conversations. But um, if you look at, you know, of course you'll think right away of like Rumpelstiltskin or Sleeping Beauty and these stories that involve spinning. Um, even Mother Goose is depicted sort of spinning while she's telling stories, which would, would have been a really common way that um, these oral histories would have been passed down because when you've been a spinner for many decades or a lace maker or any sort of textile practitioner, you don't even need to look at what you're doing anymore. So it's a perfect, um, it's a, you know, it's a perfect time period. It's a, to tell stories. Um, so, but I think it's really telling that, um, there's some stories that also show the sort of dark side of making textiles. In particular, I was interested in the, I don't, it's a lesser known story, but the three spinning women you might be familiar with. Basically it's this young woman who's in a, her cottage in the forest with her mom and her mom is yelling at her that she's so lazy. And as her mom is yelling at her, this wealthy queen or you know wealthy woman passes by and hears her mom yelling um, and so she asks, what are you yelling at your daughter for? And the mother says, oh, um, I'm yelling at her because she spun all of our flax and now we don't want any, now we don't have any more and we don't have money to buy more flax. So she lies, even though her daughter actually doesn't know how to spin. And this wealthy woman takes her to this castle and basically says, great, spin this room full of flax and you can marry my son, the prince. Um, and fortunately for her, there's these, um, three women that are depicted as deformed elderly women in, in the room with the flax. One has an oversized foot, one has an oversized lip, and one has an oversized thumb. Um, and they agree to do the spinning for her um, with the promise that she will invite them to her wedding. And so she, they do the spinning all for her overnight. She gets married to the prince, the queen is thrilled, and they arrive at the wedding and the prince says, oh my gosh, what happened to those three women? And she says, oh, well, you know, the woman with the large foot got, got, was deformed by paddling the spinning wheel. And the woman with the large lip was deformed by spinning the, the, the uh, licking the flax to spin. And the woman with the deformed thumb was um, deformed by twisting the thread. So, you know, there's wow. so much tension in these stories of, for young women to spin is, is depicts their virtue. Um, and their beauty and their grace and their marriageability. But it, but after decades of doing this really intense, because it is really intense physical labor, and you will see bobbin lace makers after decades of making lace that their knuckles are slightly enlarged. And for this reason, historically, it was not, you know, um, seen as, as beautiful for wealthy ladies to have bobbin lace as a hobby. It was more common to do needle lace to show off your long fingers. So there's these anxieties about about women's skill and knowledge that are that are made ugly, even though their mm -hmm. skill is so beautiful. Um, so I think you know, there's there's so many more fairy tales that we could even go into. Here we're seeing the Norns, who famously spin the thread of your life, and then Frau Hola, who's um, a proto like a pre-Germanic pagan deity who becomes a Brothers Grimm 
um, fairy tale character, but there's, um, I guess I'll just finish this portion by saying um, that it's so clear when you look at fairy tales, how prominent spinning was in your life and how prominent textile making mm -hmm. was. It was literally everywhere. It was mm -hmm. constant. It was all day, all times. There's frankly no period movie I've ever seen pre-industrial revolution has ever depicted enough textile making to depict <laughs> yes. reality. Because it's really the thread and the fabric of life. Um, Absolutely. So, yes. And here, my, here yeah. our language that we've been using this whole time. It's all exactly. based on that. The etymology even of, you know, craft, witchcraft and textile craft, they're, they're all mm -hmm. intertwined with each other. So there's so much Absolutely. there, but yet we don't see. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, when we were discussing fairy tales and spinning, obviously jumped to the same ideas that Elena did of Rumpelstiltskin and things like that. But also uh, my friend Austin, uh, Bane X Bramble on Instagram, they're another witch and maker. They mentioned, I think once in their podcast, uh, the Hans Christian Andersen story, The Wild Swans, uh, where 11 brothers get turned into swans by the father's uh, new bride, who was an evil witch, uh, and she wanted all of the children gone. And the daughter doesn't turn into a swan, but she is be like made to be like appear as dirty. Um, and she finds out that uh, there's a way for her to reverse it and she has to take a vow of silence and spin nettle into fiber and weave tunics for all of her brothers uh, all while remaining silent to break this curse um and if anyone has interacted with nettles before they are not comfortable to touch they they sting you as their as the name stinging nettles will tell um so she's going through this hardship of having to silently be you know hurt by a plant that she has to work with to rescue her entire family and that story I feel like particularly shows like the power of women and the work that they do that Elena referenced earlier. Um, and there's more to that story, but that's just obviously the basic overview of just like one way that spinning is tied to magic specifically in a story. Um, and myself, I have been teaching myself or learning through the internet and through friends how to spin wool into yarn and thread. Um, in the world of witchcraft uh, and folk magic, particularly red thread is a commonly used item in kind of all different types of magic. Um, in my work, I've, I kind of use it as a catch-all, um, and that's because it is a representation of a physical bloodline connecting all witches, both past and in the future together, linking all of our powers together, creating this physical bloodline. Um, so it is an item, a very simple item can hold immense power. And with that being like the thing that I want, I said, well, I have to learn to make this. So I've started to learn to spin and it is obviously not easy at first and I am not there, but uh, like kind of working my way towards using spinning to inspire a trance state and using that trance state to communicate with spirits or like do a static travel into the other world and use it as a means of both producing something I want to use in my craft, but also a way to uh, get myself uh, centered on to a idea and be able to like meditate and work through things in the other world uh, while I'm physically doing something here. Um, it's a big part of a lot of like traditional and folk traditions is using this aesthetic travel to go to the other world and go to the witch's Sabbath and things like that. Um, and that's why I think that 
there is a big connection of these women who were spinning to women who were also witches um, because a meditative craft like that leaves you open for your brain to travel elsewhere. Uh, and I think that that is um, maybe why uh, there's a loss of ideas and things like that. Like you're not going to write down in a like book that while you were spinning, you left your home and went flying through the air on your distaff. Um, but I, it's a no brainer kind of in my mind that this is something that was happening. Um, but for me, it's something I'm working on and this will be future uh, UPG as I mentioned before of like, being able to use that to center myself and use as a meditative device and then come out of it with physical representation of like my time and my like witchcraft lineage. And Elena, you mentioned to me that sometimes when people come up to you and see you uh, making your lace, they're like, what, what are you doing there? What's that magic? Right? I think we, did we lose Elena? Absolutely. Sorry. No. Elena, I think we lost you. No, so yes. Uh -oh. Am I here? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, sorry. you're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. My Wi-Fi is a little spotty. Um, anyway, but um that's always true, unfortunately. But um, yeah, it, it's funny how it inspires people to say that when I, you know, when they I've had this happen multiple times and in real life and in like social media comments, if I post a video or share or demonstrate lace making publicly, people will come up and be like, that looks craft, you know, because they can't wrap their head around it. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't, to me, it, it, it's not a surprise that I came across records in Salem, in historical Salem in the 17th century of women who were accused of being witches, um, because they were too good, because they were suspiciously good at spinning. There was a woman, um, Catherine, Katharina Harrison, she was also a powerful widow who had built a lot of wealth, wealth with her husband along the Connecticut River trading. And um, when he passed away, she inherited his business, which was also a source of great anxiety to have women as business owners. And apparently she was she was an exceptionally talented woman, including in her spinning. And she was actually accused by a neighbor of being a witch because her spinning was so good. So Mame, don't, don't get too good. Yeah, um, don't get too good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So mm -hmm. I, I want to jump back to me. Um, when we, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned how growing up in New England, um, which history was always around uh, and how you were kind of drawn to uh, evil Disney witches. Um, but 15 years ago, you started identifying as a witch yourself. Um, I was wondering if you can share a little bit about when that shift happens and why. How did you and why did you start practicing witchcraft? Yeah, um, so I think like a lot of other queer adults will understand the like thought process of like when you're a child and you have the feeling of knowing that you're other. For me, it was like, I'm a queer, like trans femme now. And I was like a little boy. Um, and I knew something was different about me and I didn't know what it was. So of course that like the only logical explanation is I'm so different because I'm a witch and everyone else is not. I was as like a little, little boy, I was obsessed with the Wicked Witch of the West as most people should be. Um, and her like over the top Adrian costume, uh, like it's had its major impact on me. And then, you know, like, every child born in like the 90s. I was, I loved the witches from Hocus Pocus. I exclusively felt like I was um, rooting for bad witches always. And I think I'm like, that's something I still do. I think I'm here to uh, be a public bad witch always. Um, 
it was it that I think being a bad witch and everyone knowing it is uh, like the closest I come to gender euphoria. Um, I can't wait to be an old crone. And all of these things are just kind of like what I was, you know, wasn't raised by any means to like be told I was a witch, but being a like youth that didn't realize what transness was, the only reasonable excuse for being so different and being so othered for the entirety of my like life now is because I'm a witch. So then it went from like playing pretend to finding out that this like is a real thing that I can do is like you can spend time investing in yourself and your ancestry and all of these things to become an actual witch in real life. So I was uh, kind of elated to figure that out and, you know, started reading books, getting on the internet and kind of trying to figure out what, how to, how to actually be a witch in real life. And, you know, that's something I still am pursuing to like figure things out. Uh, it's such a broad idea and it's I I took a break from practicing for a few years I you know had to get sober because I couldn't wield too much power while being a like alcoholic mess so I took a long break and then when I like got sobered up and I had kind of my head on straight again I dove head first back into like witchcraft and as soon as I did I realized this very deep connection between like witchcraft and making for me like making things is my easiest way to produce magic um even in like I mentioned knitting a sweater for my partner when we first started dating uh I knit them like a hat when they before they went on a trip back to the east coast and like they always ask me if it was a love spell and i will forever tell them that it was not because it it wasn't in like the way that everyone thinks of it um it was just like a spell that i knit into it uh half unintentionally half intentionally just to make sure that they like knew they were loved because they were going through like a time when they needed that um uh, yeah I just <laughs> I could I could go on for days and days uh about how um being like seeing witches on television influenced me today um and I think that like now we're it's so exciting to have people like Elena on the internet being like the most glamorous glamorous maker of all times but then also like a uh, very very cool witch <laughs> and you know you mentioned how sort of like you know the hat the knitted hat is um kind of you know this gesture of love and I always think about knitting as you know a sweater it's something that hugs you right and you put all that work all that hand work into it and it kind of like you know so to give someone a sweater and it has to have a little mistake to make sure there's uh no curses there um I think it's really a true gesture of love and you know thank you for sharing that and you know now I think we'll we'll start opening up for question because I'm already seeing um some question coming up and I'm inviting people to uh, put their question in the Q&A um someone is commenting on the gorgeous shirt I guess they mean names <laughs> um Someone, I see someone asked about the connection between spinning and witchcraft, and I think we we kind of um, uh, answered that. Um, and um, Mame, are there any other witches in your family? No, not that I know of. That's the that's the great part. Is like I can let my imagination run wild uh, and think of like what the women in my family line were doing five hundred years ago. Uh, I've recently kind of done a, a family tree connecting back to on my father's father's side. Oh, father's mother's side back to like the 1400s in France. But on my mother's father's side, I was able to trace his family to the Pennsylvania Dutch, much like Elena. 
Um, and I have to figure out that family's name because Elena wants to figure out if we were related um, through that, which I, we're really hoping for, um, which then would put Elena as the other witch in my family. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know of any, but I was just telling Elena yesterday, there was a word, I, a Polish word I had never seen before that a friend of mine just got tattooed on them. And it's like a Polish word for uh, pretty much a witch, one who gets her powers from working with the devil. And I've never felt more seen in my life uh, by this word that I would never heard. And the first four letters are C-Z-A-R, which are the last four letters in my last name. Um, so I'm curious, and it that word means to charm. Um, so I'm curious if it has magical connotations and uh, I just, I like to let my imagination run wild and assume that wherever this name came from, we were like the, uh, you know, town witches or healers charming uh, everybody to, you know, fix their cattle issues or heal their ailments, but nothing I know of uh, factually. There is a question here about uh, bobbin lace. Uh, someone says, I practice bobbin lace, which is basically making a series of knots. Can you talk about the relationship between knots and spells? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, so, bobbin lace is is sort of like braiding or interlacing threads although there are forms of lace making like like knotted netting like fillet netting that are that are specifically looped knots and there there is a whole tradition of knotted textiles like that interlace with celtic knotting and also like with sailors practices of making different knots um, that has become its own art form um, so I'm less actually familiar with specifically knots. Um, with interlacing and braiding, um, like bobbin lace, I feel like there is, um, there's actually, there's, this is a very strange reference, but there's this quote that always got me from Freud, that, that the only thing that women have ever contributed in history is braiding their pubic hair. Um, and basically it was dismissive of women's achievements. But when I thought about braiding and all that has come out of that, like braid theory and, and you know, in mathematics and also braiding is the foundation for lace making and all of these different textiles and cords and the tape loom weaving and these braids that hold our society together. I was just like, the, the fact that that would be minimized is, you know, kind of out there. But I know this sounds, this is not a great answer to your question, but I think there's just there is a magic to braiding and interlacing. There's something about it that um, you you find it all over the world in all different forms that, that people have figured out different ways to do this and make it beautiful. I don't have specific references to those because of the lack of documentation. It doesn't mean it's not out there, but I, I love your question. I wish I could answer with more specifics, but that's sort of my tangential answer for you. <laughs> How do you... Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> In the world of oh, like witchcraft, like knots can be very important. Uh, like I said, I've been reintroducing myself to the like entirety of the occult world and doing a ton of reading. And that's one constant that you will find throughout different like books that I've read is that knots can be important. Um, I think in the book New World Witchery specifically, I remember this being referenced. Um, that you can tie knots into a cord during a big storm to harness the power of that storm, and then later go in and use that power by untying the knot in like during a ritual. So that like is kind of hard to equate to lace making because you wouldn't want to go back and untie it, but you could be creating an item of like extreme power by doing it during certain elemental like weather or things like that. Uh, you can, another reference I've seen is like positioning the full moon inside of a knot and closing the knot or like around the moon to like capture and harness the full moon's energy on a cord that you can maybe wear or like some sort of thing like that where you're going to wanna harness and keep this. And I feel like that is translatable to making in so many ways. Um, I Cause I 
have not learned to make lace yet because Elena and I don't get to not spend any time in person together. Uh, but hopefully someday we can It'll have- happen. You know, yeah, our UPG of like lace and uh, knots. We're uh, gonna work on that. Yes. How do each of you personally associate your femininity with your craft? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, so my, as the founder of Brooklyn Lace Guild, the whole reason for founding the guild was to be an inclusive and welcoming space for any one of any gender identity background, anyone to get involved in lace. So I always say lace is for everyone. But for me personally, um, what drew me to it was specifically the sort of feminine baggage that's associated with lace making because it is so specifically throughout history. There's, it is, like I said, there's in other textile traditions, including embroidery and weaving, there are, there are sort of, depending on what region of the world you're in, what time period, those are often professionalized as male professions. But, um, Lace making anywhere you go in the world is really so closely associated with femininity and domesticity. And that's personally was one of the really big draws for me because it's been so overlooked throughout history. I mean, it is incredibly skillful and labor, labor intensive. And these women who were often not literate were given designs and drawings that were not technical at all. Lace designers were not necessarily who were often men and often appointed by the court or whatever. They were not actually necessarily good at, um, they didn't actually maybe know the technical aspects of how to illustrate the diagrams of lace making. So you as a lace maker, as a young woman or girl had to be able to translate that. And the level of skill that you see in these historical pieces is just staggering. And so for me to sort of elevate that through my own work has been always been my goal and to, to bring, to help people to understand and to be staggered by the beauty, the power, the skill of these things, of, of these women whose names were intentionally often not recorded. I mean, so for me, it is, it, for me, it is about um, a feminine history specifically, and that's, that's what I love about it. For me with like, I think a lot of my sewing specifically falls um, into the realm of like ancestral um, veneration uh, where I'm making like primarily vintage style clothing uh you know for the for myself but through that like the trans feminine people of like whatever time frame I'm sewing from who couldn't uh you know make these clothes and live these lives they wanted to or I'm doing the same motions uh of sewing this outfit that a trans woman in 1932 might have done for herself. So it's an act of like venerating my uh, like trans ancestral dead uh, and bringing them like power through my like expression of gender in modern times um, and use utilizing their power to kind of, you know, make it so I, can do this. Like I live in Arizona and it's a like notably scary place to be a trans person. Uh, and I would be remiss to say that like, I don't, I don't feel like there's uh, some sort of spiritual ancestral force protecting me here. We're getting a lot of questions about uh, resources and information about both uh, lace making and uh, witchcraft. And I think maybe afterwards we can kind of brainstorm about how to share it. But in the meanwhile, I can suggest to people to connect with you guys on social media. You're um, very active and engaged. And um, unfortunately, um, it's really all the time that we have left today. I, I want to thank you for this absolutely fascinating conversation and for sharing um, everything with us. I, I really very appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And, I, and I'll just say that this for us really feels like, like the beginning of a conversation and not a conclusion. So I Absolutely. hope we'll have many more opportunities to discuss this with all of you in the future. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank Terrific. you.
And I will echo that. I want to thank severely and Elena for being with us today. And of course, Karen for a wonderful talk. Please sign up uh, for the rest of you for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons like this one. Finally, the museum is open Tuesday through Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with pay-as-you-wish hours on Friday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We invite you to visit our exhibition from which this talk takes its inspiration, Salem Witch Trials Reckoning and Reclaiming in the Joyce B. Callen Women's History Gallery until January 24th. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.